Linux and Windows and Mac OS, Linux and Windows and Mac OS. I know what you're thinking. What on earth operating system should I be using if I want to learn Linux? It has to be Linux, right? I have to use Linux if I'm gonna be a Linux person. Yeah, not so much. Because look, I'm being honest, right now, what I'm recording on this computer is a Windows computer. The reason I'm using Windows is because I wanted to have an internal PCIe capture card for this camera, and the best way to do that is with Windows. Uh, I Let's see, I really like to use PowerPoint for my slides, and with PowerPoint, using a program called Auto Hotkey, which is a cool open source program, I can change the color of my pens as I'm writing. I'll demonstrate that in a second. Um, so I use Windows because it does what I need it to do. Now, if I'm on my, uh, like, on a laptop, like at the couch or something like that, I generally use Mac OS. Not because I don't love Linux, but I use Mac OS for a number of reasons. One, I use an iPhone. Every member of my family uses an iPhone, so I can use iMessages and instantly message them really easy, blue bubble friend to blue bubble friend on my Mac. Plus, a Macintosh has a really nice terminal window, an actual Unix-based terminal, so I can do all the stuff in there. And I'll be honest, Mac hardware is friggin' nice, right? It's solid, solid hardware. The operating system works really well on it, so that is generally what I use. But I also also have a lot of Linux laptops, and I mean a lot. I probably have half a dozen laptops running Linux because I really enjoy using Linux. I really oddly enjoy installing Linux. It's one of my favorite things to do, and I just love being able to play with Linux and open source software. So it doesn't matter which one you use specifically uh, because they all do the job, and most of the Linux work that you're going to do as a Linux professional is going to be inside a tiny little terminal window. So let's learn about a couple different operating systems and know that regardless of which type you use on a day-to-day -day basis, you can still be a Linux professional if you don't use Linux as your main operating system. So let's talk about Microsoft Windows because this is what most people use. And remember I talked about using PowerPoint? Well, here I am using PowerPoint and I can easily switch the color of my annotation pen just by hitting a key on my stream deck. So this is actually one of the reasons I really, really like Microsoft Windows using PowerPoint to do my slide deck. I know it's silly, but hey, it's awesome. And that's what I like. <laughs> uh, Microsoft Windows is generally uh, expensive. Now, expensive is all relative, of course, and it'll probably come with your computer. Uh, so maybe expensive isn't a problem or it's something that is a moot point because it came with it. But Compared to other things, Microsoft Windows is generally expensive. Now, the life cycle that comes with Microsoft Windows is a little bit non-standard in that it's hard to say when there's going to be a new version. Now, there are regular updates uh, to Microsoft. Like right now, Microsoft 10, or Microsoft, Microsoft Windows 10 is the current version of Microsoft Windows. Microsoft Windows 11 is coming out, but it'll generally be easy to migrate when they do version changes. And usually, the life cycle just means updates. And so there's not really a whole lot to think about when it comes to uh, the life cycle of Windows. It's generally going to be updated until... It it's no longer updated and then you'll have to migrate to something and that process won't be bad. Now, it is becoming more and more Linux-like. They include Linux as like a service that you can run right inside Microsoft Windows. So there's a lot of things that you can actually do with Linux inside a Microsoft Windows environment. It's kind of crazy. Uh, but in the end, uh, Windows is also best if you're a gamer. And I know people are going to say, Sean, you can game in Mac OS, you can game in Linux, you can run Steam on Linux. And yes, you can, that's true. You can game on any platform and gaming is getting better and better on the different platforms, but it's still going to be the best experience on Microsoft Windows. That's where things are developed first, that's where they're tested the most, and that's where the most people game. So the experience is going to be best on Windows, if that's super important for you. I'm not a gamer. Uh, I use Windows for other reasons, like I've mentioned, you know, colorful markers and stuff. But anyway, just know that if you're a gamer, Windows is probably going to be the best option if you're just starting from scratch. Now, Mac OS, or it used to be called OS 10, so you might still refer to it as, as OS 10. Uh, Mac OS is Unix based. Sort of. It has roots from Unix and it's been changed a lot and a lot of it's proprietary, but it still has a Unix-like base underneath. And that means that the terminal window that you get, uh, you know, if, you, if you're if you going to do work on the 
Mac OS terminal, it's an actual real terminal. It's not some weird bolted on thing. So there is a terminal that works really, really well. I use it a lot on a day to day basis. OS 10, or I'm sorry, I, I screwed up. Mac OS, as it's now called, is free. It's totally free. They don't charge for it anymore. They used to, but they don't charge for it. Uh, but it only runs on Apple hardware and it comes with the computer when you buy a new computer. So, I mean, yeah, it's free and you can always get the latest version for free, assuming it runs on the hardware that you have. If it gets too old, it won't run the newest versions of the operating system. But still, the OS is no longer a paid for thing. It's free with Apple products. And there are regular-ish releases, meaning that every couple years they usually release a new version of Mac OS. And like I said, you can get it for free and it will normally install on your existing hardware unless your existing hardware gets pretty old. Like for example, uh, one of my favorite laptops is a 2015 MacBook Air and it's awesome. However, it will not run the most recent version of Mac OS. And that makes me very sad and maybe I'll have to get another laptop someday. Anyway, that is Mac OS. And so that leaves us with Linux, right? The thing everybody should be using. And honestly, I really do love Linux. I mean, if you're watching this video, you should know by now that I am a huge Linux fan and I love it. And all the multiple flavors of Linux are cool. And by flavors, I really mean distributions, which we've talked about before. Uh, Linux is really awesome. And as far as like lifecycle and releases go, the kernel is regularly updated. It is, it's regularly updated. It's maintained by a huge group of people. Uh, however, the individual distributions like uh, Debian or Ubuntu or Red Hat, they handle kernel versions differently. A lot of times they'll stick with a stable kernel version and they won't update it until they update their operating system, or they will just do a few occasional stable releases of the kernel. So the kernel is regular re regularly released, but that doesn't mean that your distribution is always gonna have the most recent version of the kernel. Now, there are some distributions that do a rolling release. And what, what that means is they just constantly keep updating the software as it goes. They don't have like a release this, release that, release this, usually. Uh, Debian is an example of this. Now, there are versions of Debian that are released every so often. But in general, you can use a version of Debian forever. You install it and you just keep updating and it just keeps updating and it just keeps updating. And that's the way Debian works. The other super popular distributions have long-term support. Now, Red Hat and Ubuntu do things a little bit differently, and let's go to their website so I can show you exactly how they do that. So let's start with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now, right now we're on version eight of a 10 year cycle and version eight of RHEL or Red Hat Enterprise Linux was released, I think in 2019. So that means that we have 10 years of support where it will go all the way up to 2019. But the first five years are the full support and then you have to pay extra, I think, for the maintenance support or they only start, they only will do like bug fixes after this. Just know that there is a 10 year support window for a Red Hat Enterprise Linux version. And then after that, it goes into extended life phase where you pay and it's not great because they don't update anything. They'll just like keep it going for you if you pay them. But realize these are all paid. With Red Hat Linux, everything here is paid. And so uh, the software itself will be updated all the way up until 10 years and then the maintenance windows and what they update changes. If we scroll down here, we'll see exactly how it works. So yeah, 2019 is when they released version eight. Now there is a point release every six months or so. And that means that you have to keep your system updated to this minor release. So 8.0, 8.1, uh, 8.10 will come out in 2024. And then it will stay 8.10 because remember it's updated like regularly for five years. And then for the five years after that, they just kind of like keep it going. And so it's important to know that the feature updates and stuff will stop after the first five years, and then it'll just like keep running for five more years. And that's basically how Red Hat Enterprise Linux works. Now, I said 8 was released in 2019. Right now, there's a beta version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9 because they usually release a new version of RHEL, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, every three or four years or so. And so if you start 
you get that 10 year cycle that starts over at the beginning as soon as they release this thing. Now, a beta version means that you can test it. It's no cost, right? You can get it. There's no fee at all because you are testing their software for them, right? Nobody recommends that you use this beta software in a production environment there. You're just testing their software for them. So it's in beta right now, which means that, yes, you can use it for free, but know that it's not something you should run your your everyday stuff on because beta software means there's lots of bugs that they're trying to have you help them work out. Now I have to talk about controversy because Red Hat Enterprise Linux has a huge recent controversy. There used to be a really neat operating system or distribution called CentOS. And what CentOS was is they took all of the Red Hat code, because remember, this is open source software. So Red Hat has to release all of their, um, all their source code for free so that you can have it. Well, people took that code and compiled it into an operating system called CentOS, which stood for Community Enterprise OS. And it was free. You didn't pay for it, but it was like a bite for bite exact copy of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, just without the support and without the paid uh, requirements. So what you could do, especially if you were like a school, which is what I did for a long number of years, uh, if you were a school and you wanted to have that 10 years of rock solid running uh, Red Hat interface, our operating system, you could install CentOS and it would work perfectly. But Red Hat actually somehow bought the CentOS group. And then recently, like a year or so ago, they decided to do away with CentOS. We're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to have a side-by-side -side free version of our software. We're just going to kill that project, which really upset people, myself included, because it was a great way to use Red Hat. Even if you weren't a big company and, and you couldn't afford to use Red Hat, you could still take advantage of all those open source tools uh, using CentOS knowing that you weren't going to get support from Red Hat. Anyway, um, I'll show you what's happening now. The person who originally uh, started CentOS has started a new operating system called Rocky Linux. And the goal, now this is brand new, right? But the goal of Rocky Linux is to basically be a new CentOS. It's basically supposed to be exactly like Red Hat Enterprise Linux with a 10 year support cycle and no cost. And the same guy that started CentOS has started this. And his idea is we're not going to let it fall apart again. We're going to keep it separate and we're not going to let Red Hat uh, take it away. So anyway, I don't know what's going to happen with Rocky Linux, but that's the goal with Rocky Linux is to be the new CentOS. We'll see what happens. And now, you know, uh, <laughs> the Rocky history, <laughs> Rocky history of CentOS and Red Hat. The one last thing we're going to cover, though, is Ubuntu. And Ubuntu just personally is my favorite, but that's just because I was a Debian user and Ubuntu is based on Debian. But the release cycle for Ubuntu is extremely regular. And how it works is you have the regular interim versions and then you have LTS or long-term support versions. And these are the, the most recent versions of the long-term support. And how Ubuntu numbers is the year dot the month that it was released. So back in April of 2014, 1404 long-term support was released and it is supported for five years for everybody, it's free, there's no cost. If you want to have an additional five years of support, you can pay Ubuntu and they will help keep your servers going and, and secure and stuff for five more years. Most people just use the LTS version for five years. And you know, sometime towards the end, they will upgrade to the most recent because every two years, there is a new LTS release. So if you do the math, you have five years of support, on something that is released every two years. So it's really nice. It gives you a long time to transition. For example, I still have a server on 1604. And right now that's not great because uh, the official support has run out. So I really got to upgrade it. And I am going to wait because in April of 2022, this version of LTS, Jammy Jellyfish, is going to come out, and then I will have five full years of support, which is just awesome. But the nice thing about Ubuntu is that it's released regularly, and you know exactly how long it will be supported. These interim versions are released every six months. They're only supported for nine months, and not many people use them, myself included, because I don't want to have to upgrade to another operating system every six to nine months. But if you want to try out something cool, you know, that's the latest version. You 
can try it. It's just, I don't know. I generally just stick to LTS. And it turns out 95% of people who use Ubuntu use an LTS version. They don't use those interim step releases. Anyway, that's how it works. And the last thing I want to talk about are Linux servers versus Linux desktops. And we've talked about this in previous videos. Basically, a Linux server is just a Linux machine that usually doesn't have a GUI. But of course, you could run a GUI on your server. That's fine. It just takes up resources to get that GUI going that you would normally want to dedicate to the server processes. Uh, so it doesn't usually have a GUI. And usually, if you're going to run Linux server, it's going to have a stable version of the OS, right? It's going to be an LTS because you don't want to have to upgrade a server every six months. That's just a lot. And generally, you don't need the most cutting edge software on a server if you're just doing things like serving web pages or databases or things like that. So Linux server generally just means it doesn't have a GUI front end, whereas a Linux desktop usually has a GUI. Now, I have a friend, Kyle Rankin. He's like a super geeky Linux guy that makes me look like a not Linux geeky guy. <laughs> he does almost everything in a terminal window. I don't even know if his desktop machine even has a GUI. It might. It probably does, actually. Uh, but generally, a Linux desktop will have a GUI, but it doesn't necessarily have to. If you just want a terminal window, hey, boot your laptop up to that. Uh, often, if you're going to have a more recent version, like one of those interim Ubuntu releases, it's going to be on a desktop machine because uprooting your own personal stuff and restoring it isn't as much of a hassle as working on uh, and upgrading a server. Generally, upgrading servers is a real pain in the butt, which is why I still have one running 16.04, which is not secure. Thankfully, it's behind my firewall in my house. It's not public facing, et cetera, et cetera. But generally, that's the difference between a Linux desktop and a Linux server. So that's the various operating systems, how they work, why they work, the way they work. What you use isn't that big of a deal because everything important on Linux is done in the terminal window and you can get to a terminal window from any operating system you want, whether it's Windows or Mac OS or of course, Linux. Now, I wanna remind you to learn everything, do what you love, and most importantly, be kind. I'll see you in the next video. And if there's other stuff that I brought up that maybe makes you want me to uh, start a series on, I don't know, Ubuntu LTS support channels. Actually, I don't want to do that. So don't give me that idea. But if you have other ideas that you'd like me to cover, let me know in the comments. If this series is fun for you, please hit like on the video because then I'll know that this is the sort of thing you want to see. And of course, if you want to see more of me more often, just subscribe. And then you'll know every time I put one of these videos up. See you next time.